58 years ago, on February the 7th, 1964, the Beatles arrived in America. I Want to Hold Your Hand was the number one single, and their debut album Meet the Beatles would top the album chart the following week. This stateside success was a year overdue, and had Capital not spent most of 1963 asleep at the wheel, it would have happened much sooner. Yet it was a different story north of the border at Capital Canada, who by the end of 1963 had already released five Beatles singles and given them their first North American number one, a full two months before I Want to Hold Your Hand hit the top spot in the US. This remarkable feat was in large part due to one man's intuition, belief and leadership, and who against all the odds helped Canada beat the US to Beatlemania. I'm Andrew from Parlogram Auctions, and welcome to Beatlemania in Canada. In 1963, Capital Canada enjoyed one big advantage over Capital USA. Dave Dexter Jr. wasn't working for them. Dexter was Capital's A&R manager at their main office in Hollywood and was responsible for which acts went onto their label. Dexter was then a 47-year-old ex-journalist whose first love was jazz. He'd spent much of 1963 writing the follow-up to his 1946 book, Jazz Cavalcade, The Inside Story of Jazz called The Jazz Story from the 90s, that's the 1890s, to the 60s, which ended up being published in 1964. Clearly ill-suited to the job in hand, Dexter's total rejection of all the Beatles' first four singles, not to mention his treatment of their catalogue and sound quality, is legendary, but that's a discussion for another day. Instead, we'll turn the spotlight on his opposite number in Canada, Paul White, a man who couldn't have been more different. Born 20 years after Dexter in Western Supermare in England, White had emigrated to Canada in February 1957 and settled in Toronto with dreams of becoming the next Ernest Hemingway. White wasn't the only expat who had followed their dreams to Canada. The 1954 Canadian census showed that 6.7 million, or 44% of Canada's total population of 15.2 million, could trace their origins back to the British Isles. So it's not surprising that the Beatles themselves had connections to the country too. George Harrison's older sister Louise, together with her husband and two young children, had left their home in Inverness in Scotland in 1956 and had stayed for some time in North Virginia Town in Ontario before settling in Benton, Illinois. Cynthia's mother Lillian had travelled to Toronto in July 1961 to look after Cynthia's cousin's baby before returning to Liverpool for good in October 1963 to help her daughter look after the young Julian. Also, Dot Roan, Paul's steady girlfriend from 1960 to 1962, for whom Paul had written P.S. I Love You, emigrated to Ontario in 1964. Capitol Records in the mid-1950s was a company going places fast. It had built up a roster of artists second to none in popular music at that time. Nat King Cole, Frank Sinatra, Peggy Lee, to name but a few. Unable to find meaningful employment at any of the newspapers in Toronto, Paul White landed a job as a shipper or storeman at Capitol Records of Canada. He impressed his bosses right away by organising a five-pin bowling league and was marked as someone whose initiative could be used elsewhere in the company. A few months after EMI purchased Capital in 1955, White was made an offer he couldn't refuse and became Capital Canada's singles promotion manager. With a turnover of $20 million at the time, EMI's policy of allowing capital to continue with minimal interference from London was understandable, but did little to establish their own UK base tax in America. In the spring of 1960, White was sent to London for meetings at EMI HQ in Manchester Square, where he met several of EMI's staff producers, John Burgess, Jeff Love, Walter Ridley, Norman Yule, and of course, George Martin. Up until that point, White had to decide which records to promote on the Canadian market based on sample discs sent from Capital USA, which had already been through the dreaded Dexter filter. 
As a result, and to his frustration, he ended up missing out on many of Cliff Richard's early hits, which ended up on the small independent Spartan label in Canada, and ABC Paramount in the US. White's big break came later in 1960, when he began receiving requests from his salesman for an album by a well-known saxophone player in England who had died in 1950, named Freddie Gardner. Tracing the recordings to EMI in London, he ordered up the tapes and put together an album. Needing a catalogue number, he went to Capitol in Hollywood, where he was assigned T6000, which became the Capitol 6000 album series. White's next big success was with Parlophone recording star Matt Monroe. My Kind of Girl had been a top five hit in the UK, but guess what? Dexter had passed on it. However, White was impressed enough with the single to issue an album of Matt's called Love Is The Same Anywhere, which sold well enough for Matt to embark on a short tour of Canada later that year. During 1962, Capital Canada went where Dexter never dreamt of going, issuing EMI recorded singles by the likes of Bernard Cribbins, The John Barry Seven, Joe Loss, and Mike Sand's comedy duet with Wendy Richard called Come Outside, which even got to number one. In the absence of any Canadian equivalent to Billboard or Cashbox, White produced the Sizzle Sheet in August 1962. Named to tie in with Capital's hot new red and orange label design, this was a promotional flyer designed to keep DJs and radio station programmers up to date with the latest Capital releases. The sheet was populated equally by US releases and the 72,000 series of singles from the likes of Mike Sarn, Frank Ifield, and others I've just mentioned, and proved extremely popular and successful. The ground was further prepared for the coming of the Beatles by the 16-year-old singing star Helen Shapiro, whose singles and albums were selling well on Capitol in Canada, and was backed up by a well-received TV appearance on CBC in November 1962. It was shortly after this appearance that Paul White received one of his regular batches of sample 45s from EMI. The box contained several UK Top 30 records on the EMI group of labels, which included the James Bond theme by the John Barry Seven, Lovesick Blues by Frank Ifield, Joe Loss and his orchestra with It Must Be Madison, and Love Me Do by a group called The Beatles. It was White's job to listen to each of the 45s in the box and select the ones he thought Capital Canada could release. Similar boxes had been landing on Dexter's desk in Hollywood for quite some time, but as far as he was concerned, there was only one place for this kiddie music. But White, with his younger Anglophile tuned ears, heard something different, and upon hearing Love Me Do, thought, that's different, and put it on his Listen Again pile. When he did listen to it again, he decided that he had to get it released. But there was no rush. After all, Capital USA had first refusal, and he had to make sure that Dexter didn't want it first, which of course he didn't. In fact, it wouldn't be until April 1964 that Love Me Do finally saw the light of day in the US, which wasn't on Capital, but on the VJ subsidiary Tolly. Dexter also passed on Please Please Me, which ended up on VJ in February 1963. But being a regional rather than a national record label, VJ had problems getting the disc into the stores, and it flopped. Like most of the records released by UK artists in Canada at the time, there was no precious EMI master tape to work with. All of the 45s released were cut from dubs of UK discs. The copy used as the source of Capital Canada's release of Love Me Do was a regular UK red label first pressing. So the version on the Canadian single, like the UK issue, carried the original 4th of September 1962 recording with Ringo on drums, and not the album version, recorded one week later with session musician Andy White on drums. RCA Victor handled all of Capital Canada's mastering and pressing duties at that time, and White himself drove over to their studios in Toronto to get the record cut on their Scully lathe. These lacquers were then sent to RCA's pressing plant in Smith Falls, where stampers were made and the discs pressed. If Capital was unsure how a record would do, they would only have 1,000 copies pressed, which is what happened with Love Me Do, and indeed the next four Beatles singles. <laughs> 
From that initial first run of a thousand, 200 copies were distributed to Canadian radio stations and media. Love Me Do was released on Monday, February the 18th, 1963, but ended up selling just 78 copies. The remaining copies were sent back to the pressing plant to be recycled. White remembers getting all of the sample discs back from RCA after they'd finished with them and allowing his assistants to take them home with them later. Needless to say, copies from that initial run of Love Me Do are extremely collectible, and they can be identified in two ways. Firstly, by their slightly larger handwritten matrix numbers in the runoff grooves, without a following dash. And secondly, the R of Capitol Records of the 9 o'clock label position is printed into the yellow part of the record label. The single was repressed in early 1964 with a large matrix number and no dash. Some of these copies ended up being imported into the US, and these copies have a dash 2 matrix ending. Despite its failure sales and chart-wise, Capital Canada didn't give up on the Beatles, and Please Please Me, Ask Me Why was released on April the 1st, 1963. This was also dubbed from a UK 45, but did better than Love Me Do, selling 180 copies, and managed to chart at number 40 on the local radio station CFPL. From Me To You, Backed With Thank You Girl, was released by Capital Canada on Monday, June the 17th, 1963. Unfortunately, this coincided with Del Shannon's cover version of the song, and the two versions spent two months cancelling each other out on the chart. She Loves You was released in the UK on August the 28th. Confident this would be the one to break the group in the US, EMI's senior management dispatched a young man called Roland Rennie to New York with the specific task of getting the record released on Capitol. Working alongside their American lawyer and broker company Transglobal Music, Rennie once again found themselves rejected by the impossible Dave Dexter Jr. The result being that the single ended up on Swan Records out of Philadelphia. After striking out three times with Beatles singles, White had a tough job convincing his bosses to spend yet more money on the group, but won them over by telling them that She Loves You was going to be the one. With permission granted, She Loves You was released on Capital Canada on Monday, September the 18th and on Swan in the US at the same time, impressively in less than a month after its UK release. Coincidentally, it was on that very same day that George Harrison and his brother Peter touched down in the US for a two-week holiday at their sister Louise Coldwell's house in Benton, Illinois. George and Peter also visited New York a few days later, which would be the last time George would be able to walk through the streets of New York with such freedom. Unfortunately, She Loves You was far from the instant smash White had expected it to be. Sales built up only slowly in smaller markets, and it limped onto the CKLB chart at number 45 on September the 27th. Then nothing for three months. Things were looking bleak until it was lined up alongside the singing nun and chubby checker as promising in a column in the Ontario London Free Press on November the 16th. Sales then began to gather momentum in other small regional areas until finally it was listed at number one in the London Free Press chart on Saturday, December the 21st, becoming the first Beatles disc to hit the number one spot in Canada. Now all they needed was an album. Dexter had famously passed on the Please Please Me album in 1963, and the rights to it had passed to VJ in Chicago. Dexter also flip-flopped about with the Beatles, until finally having no choice but to sign the Beatles to Capital USA in mid-December 1963. EMI were reporting advance orders of 250,000 for With The Beatles in the UK, a fact that didn't go unnoticed at Capital Canada. So on Monday the 18th of November, they contacted EMI in London seeking permission to release the album for the Canadian market. Brian Epstein and EMI were desperate to break into the American market, and viewing Canada as an important stepping stone to the US granted permission for Capital Canada to go ahead. Unlike Meet the Beatles, Capital Canada chose to go with the same running order as the UK issue. Once the 10-inch Emmy tape box containing a mono dub of the UK master tape had arrived at Toronto Airport, it was driven directly to RCA Victor's studio in Mutual Street, where the lacquers were created on their scully lathe. These were then sent to RCA Victor's pressing plant in Smith Falls, 
where the stampers were made and the records pressed. The cover artwork, which would have been shipped with the tape, was sent directly to Pars Print and Litho on Yonge Street in Toronto, where the album's slicks were printed. The version of the cover supplied by EMI used the dark, grainy photo of the group, which is found on the earliest UK pressings. This was later changed in the UK with a lighter, less moody shot after its initial print run. Robert Freeman's classic shot of the Beatles captured in the dining room of the Palace Court Hotel in Bournemouth on the afternoon of Saturday, August the 24th, 1963, was left unadorned on the UK issue, but Capital Canada felt it needed something else. As the Beatles were not yet household names in Canada, Capital felt they needed to employ some hard sell tactics. So they not only renamed the album Beatlemania, but also spiced up the front panel with some snappy journalistic quotes. Paul White personally selected the quotes, the first of which was from Sandy Gardner, the influential journalist from the Ottawa Journal who had first raved about She Loves You. And this read, The newspapers say a new disease is sweeping through Britain and doctors are powerless to stop it. It's Beatlemania. This Liverpool group play to packed houses wherever they go. The next was by a Canadian journalist working for the Canadian press in London named Alan Harvey, who added, The Beatles have created a teenage cult, more frenetic than anything the Bobby Sox has dreamt of in the heyday of Frank Sinatra. Four pop idols for the price of one. Then came a quote from Time magazine, lifted from an article on page 64 of their November 15, 1963 issue, which read, at the Royal Variety Performance Show, the Queen Mother beamed. A raucous, big beat sound. Good clean fun. Beatlemania. Was striking everywhere. The final quote from Newsweek magazine comprised several snippets from a similar article from Monday, November the 18th, which read, Their theatre appearances draw screaming fans. The Queen Mother found them so young, fresh and vital. They stamp about and shake. Prance. Skip. Who knew the Queen Mother was such a fan? The rear panel of the album was basically a straight reproduction of the UK edition, complete with Tony Barrow's sleeve notes and the word Beatlemania added to the top. The vinyl itself was pressed by RCA Victor, which is identifiable by the large pressing ring on the label. The matrices of the disc match that of the UK pressing, XEX447 for side one, and XEX448 for side two, which confirms that they're straight copies of the UK master tape. After use, the tape was returned to Capital Canada's tape library, where it would be called back into service a number of times during the 1960s. That 10 inch master tape still exists in Capital Canada's tape archive, but the tape itself has since been replaced with the latest stereo master. It's possible that the mono reels, like so many other vintage reels, were just thrown out, but if anyone knows differently, please let me know. Already stretched during the busy pre-Christmas period, workers at RCA Victor's pressing plant at Smith Falls initially managed to press out 25,000 copies in two days. White ambitiously set the release date for this album on the same day as the UK release, November 22nd, in the end, it came out on November 25th, which in itself was a remarkable feat of teamwork and organisation. 50,000 copies were sold in the first couple of weeks, and Beatlemania would go on to become Canada's second best-selling Beatles album of the 1960s, selling almost 200,000 by the end of 1967. The release of Meet the Beatles in the US on January 20th, 1964, successfully extricated Dave Dexter from the hole he'd spent a year digging himself into, unlike White, who'd believed in the Beatles right from the start. No stereo mix was available or issued of this album during the 1960s, mainly because stereo was not very popular at the time, and also they would take up valuable stock space in stores, which could be occupied by monocopies. One pressing of this album which is particularly sought after by collectors is the so-called deep groove pressing. These pressings contained a high proportion of what's known as ring flash vinyl, which were pieces of vinyl which had been trimmed from the edges of the disc just after it left the press. This recycled material resulted in heavier, thicker discs with visually and physically deeper grooves. It's likely that only a few hundred of these pressings were made, and they are now rare and of course very expensive. <laughs> 
However, if you want to check out a similar pressing at a cheaper rate, the same features exist on copies of Vera Lynn's Hits of the Blitz, which was pressed at the same time. A stereo version of the album eventually appeared in 1978, with two different mixes in three configurations. First is the so-called wide mix, which features the strong separation between the vocal and instrumental channels, which is basically the same as the original UK pressing. Then there's the narrow mix, which features a more centralized stereo mix. Capital not only issued separate wide and stereo mixes of this album, but also pressings which included both. These hybrid pressings tend to be on the purple Capital Dome labels. The pressing I have here is a mid-1980s rainbow label pressing with an ST6051 matrix, which contains the wide stereo mix on both sides. One thing I did notice about this pressing is that unlike the UK pressing, there's an almost total absence of any vocal artifacts or bleed through in the instrumental channel. It's a very dry sounding pressing with good EQ choices and one I highly recommend. There was also a purple dome label pressing with a cutting error on the track Don't Bother Me, which was corrected for the rainbow labels. Following Beatlemania, Capital Canada released two other unique Beatles albums, which I'll be covering in a future video. Paul White left Capital after an illustrious career in 1978 and passed away in March 2018. But his legacy in breaking the Beatles in Canada will never be forgotten. I hope you enjoyed this brief Beatles history lesson and that you'll come back again for another one real soon. In the meantime, please consider subscribing or even becoming a channel member, which really does help to keep the channel going. Last but not least, if you'd like to buy some great sounding Beatles vinyl, do visit our website, parlogramauctions.com. But that's all for this one, so I'll say bye for now and thanks for watching.